From 907 AD to 960, a span of only 53 years, North China saw a series of short-lived regimes, the later Liang, Tang, Jin, Han, and Zhou, known collectively as the Five Dynasties. The rest of China was divided into 10 states, large and small, known to history as the Ten Kingdoms. The wheel of history had turned once again. China entered an era of mutinies and continuous war. In 884 AD, during the later Tang Dynasty, a grand banquet was held in the city of Shangyan in Bianzhou Prefecture. Like the Hongmen Banquet during the Han Dynasty, it was the venue for a battle of wits that would not only go down in history, but would become the stuff of legend. The leading figures at the banquet were Zhu Wen, the military governor of Shanwu, and Li Keyong, the military governor of Hedong. Zhu Wen had been a general in the Huang Chao Rebellion, but he defected to the Tang side, then turned his army against the rebellion, crushing it, and consolidating his power in Bianzhou Prefecture. Facing him was Li Keyong, chief of the Turkic Sha Tuo tribe in the north. Known as the Leaping Tiger, he was also called the One-Eyed Dragon because he was blind in one eye. His increasingly powerful forces were concentrated around Taiyen, east of the Yellow River. The two men had joined forces to defeat the Huang Chao rebels. Zhu Wen invited Li Keyong to the banquet to celebrate their joint victory. Young and ambitious, Li Keyong could not conceal his arrogance. Zhu Wen was offended, but he kept his emotions to himself. He was saving the reckoning for after the banquet. Jiangshi Li Keyong was unaware that Zhu Wen's men had secretly surrounded the inn where he was staying. When night fell, Zhu Wen's men suddenly fired a barrage of flaming arrows at Li Keyong's guards, killing 300 of them. Luckily for Li, at that moment a storm broke, dousing the flames. With the help of his bodyguards, he escaped. The former comrades were now mortal enemies. This was the start of a bitter power struggle that would shape the political landscape of the Five Dynasties period. By the end of the 9th century, the Tang Empire was in decline. The suppression of the Huang Chao Rebellion had helped strengthen the regional governors. Now they were forming alliances with imperial ministers and court eunuchs who went on battling each other throughout the dying days of the empire. In 900, the eunuchs had killed several ministers and were on the point of deposing Emperor Zhao Tsong. Only the regional powers seemed capable of saving the imperial court from usurpers. All eyes turned to the governor of Shen Wu, Zhu Wen. The chancellor, Cui Yin, wrote a secret letter to Zhu Wen, asking him to send troops. Seeing the request as the chance of a lifetime, Zhu Wen set out at once for Chang'an. When the eunuch, Han Shanhui, heard about it, he and other eunuchs took Emperor Zhao Tsung hostage. He then sought protection from Li Mao Jun, the governor of Fengxiang, but he was no match for Zhu Wen. 
He was soon defeated and forced to release the emperor. The victory gave Zhu Wen complete control of the Tang central government. A bloodbath ensued. Zhu Wen wasted no time in slaughtering more than 700 palace eunuchs or in dissolving the Tang central army, the so-called army of divine strategy, which the eunuchs had long controlled. At first, he was acclaimed as a loyal official, but it wasn't long before he showed his true colors. Next, he began killing the imperial ministers, including Sui Yin, the chancellor. He destroyed Chang'an, the Tang capital, burning down palaces and ordinary houses alike, and carried off Emperor Zhao Tsung to Luoyang, where he too was soon killed. By 907, Zhu Wen was ready to establish his own dynasty, the later Liang. It was the first of the five dynasties that would succeed the Tang in the Central Plains. After 289 years, the Tang dynasty had finally come to an end. But had the Tang and its influence disappeared altogether? After establishing the later Liang, Zhu Wen conquered two stubbornly defended military regions, Weibo and Chengde. But there remained one important figure who refused to accept the end of the Tang dynasty, none other than Zhu Wen's mortal enemy, Li Keyong. Since the Shangyan banquet 23 years earlier, Li Keyong had changed from a reckless young man into a mature military ruler in charge of the Herdung region. He would prove to be the biggest threat to the later Liang dynasty. These two powers now began a struggle for control of the Central Plains. When the news reached Taiyuan that Zhu Wen had killed Emperor Zhao Tsung, Li Keyong wailed in the direction of Luoyang vowing to kill the traitor Zhu Wen and restore the Tang dynasty. From military Zhu Wen imposed brutal discipline on his army. It was very harsh. He ordered that if any officer was killed in battle or deserted, the soldiers under that officer's command would be executed. This was the infamous chained responsibility order. But if Zhu Wen was brutal to his own men, he was even more so with his enemies. In contrast, Li Keyong organized his army around a code of loyalty. He adopted 12 warriors as his sons, who together with his own son formed a band of 13 warriors. Bonds of kinship-like affinity bound his whole army, making it a formidable force. At the Jinjong Art School in Shanxi province, Students are rehearsing productions for the new year. One of them is Ya Guan Pavilion, the story of Li Keyong and his adopted son, Li Tsun Shao. Although only a teenager, Li Tsun Shao was an outstanding soldier who captured the Huang Chao general, Meng Zhuhai. In the days when traditional Chinese operas were more popular, there were many classic dramas based on the story of Li Keyong and his legendary 13 warriors. Everyone knew titles like Sha Tuo Kingdom, Yaguan Pavilion, Leaping Tiger's Mountain, and Taiping Bridge. According to these accounts, Li Keyong's 13 sons were brilliant martial artists who carried all before them. Li Tsun Shao was the most valiant of all, 
popping up everywhere and treating the battlefield as if it were his playground. Lee ke Yong and his adopted sons were extremely close. They fought together always with great success. Lee ke Yong's these so-called ER, ah, actually, is that he is in this, is that he is in the Zhongyuan region, because he is a minority ethnic group. So he is in the Zhongyuan region, so he has to build his own political party. 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 He has to when Zhu Wen founded the later Liang dynasty, the conflict intensified as each side prepared to launch its final bid for victory. At this critical point, in the first month of 908, Li Keyong suddenly fell ill and died. But right up to the time of his death, he was still making plans. Naming his son Li Tsun Shu as king of Jin, Li Keyong gave him three arrows to remind him of their three enemies. The first arrow was for the military governor Liu Rangong and his son Liu Shouguan, who controlled Yozhou Prefecture. The second arrow was for the Khitan Empire in the north. And the final arrow was for their mortal enemy, Zhu Wen.首先去攻打朱恩呢，还是首先稳定自己的后方，把北方的像刘仁恭以及一直对中原构成强大威胁的契丹的势力加以削弱呢？这是当时的一些这个政治家和军事家呀需要做出的一个重大的战略选择。李
古代十国的南方地区啊，如果跟北方地区相比，那么突出表现为这样两个不同：第一呢是相对比较安定；第二，社会经济有非常大的发展。为了在彼此竞争当中取得胜利，这些割据南方的这个地方政权啊，他们竞相采取了这个发展经济、保境安民的这样一些这个政策。这对于当时的社会经济的恢复啊，还有这个持续发展，是有非常大的这个促进作用。The famous cities of Suzhou and Hangzhou once belonged to the kingdom of Wu Ye. Its founder and king Qian Miu greatly improved irrigation for silk production, making his kingdom one of the richest in the southeast. It also boasted magnificent buildings. The Yunyan Pagoda in Suzhou led the world in construction techniques at that time. Striking structures such as this, together with the natural beauty of the landscape, made both cities greatly admired. It was said Suzhou and Hangzhou are heaven on earth. 杭末的时候，由于战乱啊，呃，中原的很多那个官宦和士人都纷纷避难，避难来到这个呃前蜀王国。然后，王建在他们的帮助下，就模仿唐代的官制，建立了一套政治制度，呃，这也是很完善的一套政治制度，呃，然后呢，由于这个蜀地，它有很多天险，可以说是聚险一方，呃，在这样一个得天独厚的条件下，然后呢，嗯，前蜀的经济得到很大的发展。Wang Jian may have been a wise ruler, but his son and heir was ruthless and stupid. Former Shu staggered on until it was eventually succeeded by later Shu under Meng Chang. Under his reign, the kingdom grew prosperous and powerful. Arts and culture also flourished during the later Shu period. Meng Chang was an artistic young man and an ardent patron of Chinese opera, earning him the title Patron Saint Meng. 苏川还是从前被誉为其的雕刻和布置艺术。方玉英是世上少数的艺术家仍在坚持这种艺术方式在成都。她已经在做这件事情超过十年。从古代的苏州到现在，苏川始终不被人注意。这个时期的战争使得他感到无法与他人交流。这个时期的和平和繁荣。Allowed Sir Chuan embroidery to develop and flourish. Today, Fang Yu Ying's work is very popular, especially this beautiful design, Madame Flower Pistol. Madame Flower Pistol was Meng Chang's favorite consort. She was not only beautiful but also a renowned poet. Known for her collection, Palace Poems. Chengdu is known as the city of hibiscuses. It got the name thanks to Madame Flower Pistol. It is said that Madame Flower Pistol loved hibiscuses and peonies, so Meng Chang ordered the locals to plant hibiscus trees throughout the city. When they were in season, Chengdu was full of hibiscus blossoms, giving the city its title.
The Chancellor of later Shu, Wu Zhaoyi, helped compile 500 poems from the Five Dynasties period for a book called A Collection of Songs Among Flowers. He also used his own wealth to build schools and persuaded the king to reprint the Confucian classics. This led to a literary renaissance in Sir Chuan. The kingdom acquired an air of romance and sophistication. While the Central Plains remained mired in war, the kingdom of later Shu became a cultural mecca. In south-central China was the city of Tanzhou, seat of the kingdom of Chu. Known today as Changsha, the city was the biggest tea market in the south, contributing millions in tax revenue every year. Also in the south, Nanping took advantage of its status as a buffer zone to expand its economy. Southern Han, south of the Nanling Mountains, was secluded enough to develop its culture and education. Meanwhile, Northern Han, the only kingdom in the north, was able to maintain peace with its neighbors, the Khitan Empire. Tangua 北方地区的这样一种旧的格局的打破，加上了南方地区商品经济发展的这么一种潮流，可能就不会出现清明上河图那样的一种这个令人神往的商业贸易非常繁荣的景象。这是就五代十国的它的后世影响。Although the Nine Kingdoms in the South were developing well, none of them was able to turn a new page in the history of China. That drama was playing out in the Central Plains. Li Keryong's heir, Li Tsunshu, was about to fulfill his father's wish by launching a bid for power. He placed the three arrows his father had given him on the family shrine. Every time he set off for battle, he took the three arrows with him in a silken bag. When he returned victorious, he replaced them on the shrine. They were a constant reminder of his father's words. In 913, Li Tsunshu's troops seized Yojo Prefecture giving him control of the whole Hebei region. He captured Liu Rengong and spilled his blood as an offering to his father. The oath of the first arrow had now been fulfilled. In 922, Li Tsunshu and his troops succeeded in driving the Khitans out of the northern border region. That fulfilled the vow of the second arrow. In 923, Li Chunshu proclaimed himself emperor of the later Tang dynasty. He was now ready to fulfill the pledge of the third arrow. The final battle was about to begin. Meanwhile, in 912, Zhu Wen had been killed in a coup staged by the younger of his two sons. The later Liang dynasty was in decline. In the 10th month of 923, Li Chunshu led an attack on Bianjing, the capital of later Liang. The once mighty dynasty collapsed. The victory elated Li Tsunshu, 
He felt like the hero of the world, unrivaled and unbeatable. His only regret was that he had not had the opportunity to slay Juwon with his own hands. But this warrior turned emperor was about to turn a different page in his dramatic life. Ever since childhood, Li Sun Shu had been a talented composer of songs. After conquering the Central Plains, he often performed in operas with Ling actors under the stage name Li Tian Sha, ruler of the world. The term Ling dated from the era of the Yellow Emperor, nearly 2,800 years before. According to tradition, the Yellow Emperor appointed Ling Lun as his director of music. Directors of music became known as Ling. Then professional actors were also called Ling. Traditionally, they were looked down upon. But Li Sun Shu looked up to them and began to entrust them with important government positions, a move unprecedented in Chinese history. The Ling actors suddenly began to play real-life political roles, while the heroes who had risked their lives for Li Sun Shu and the later Tang Dynasty were overlooked. While some of the Ling actors turned officials were diligent and ethical, most abused their powers and intimidated others at court. One such former actor was Jing Jin, who obtained a position as imperial inspector. Whenever anyone tried to thwart him, he turned to the emperor, whose decision always went in his favor. In 925, the eunuchs and the Ling officers selected 3,000 girls to be the emperor's consorts. In 926, Li Sun Shu believed a false accusation against his minister, Guo Chung Tao, and had him killed, even though he had been instrumental in helping him conquer former Shu. This provoked a mutiny in Weizhou Prefecture, and the capital, Luoyang, descended into chaos. General Guo Chung Chen was a former Ling actor who had been very close to Guo Chung Tao. He decided to avenge Guo's death by launching an assault on Luoyang. With the capital now deserted, Li Sun Shu had no troops except for his own bodyguards. Once a leading general, he was reduced to fighting his last battle virtually on his own. Dejected and broken, the emperor was struck and killed by an arrow after a mere three years on the throne. Only one Ling actor paid tribute by covering his body with old musical instruments and lighting a funeral pyre. Li Sun Shu might have been a talented writer, composer and performer, hailed as the father of Chinese opera, but he was also the author of his own dramatic life story, one of both triumph and tragedy. Musical instruments, along with bows and arrows, were the props in the drama of his life. In the words of the Song Dynasty poet Ou Yang Shu, his life ended as it began. Li Sayan was the eldest of Li Keyung's adopted warrior sons. He had served with distinction under both Li Keyung and Li Sun Shu. During the mutiny in Weizhou, he had been responsible for suppressing the rebels. Not long afterwards, his troops joined with the former rebels to support him becoming the new emperor. This latest mutiny was to Li's advantage. But he knew that once he stepped onto the imperial stage, any further tendencies to mutiny would have to be strongly curbed, or he would become the next victim. Oh. 
但实际上在五代的时候呢，禁军其实是指那种精锐部队、正规军。那这个禁军呢，一方面他们的这个兵士相对来说呢是战斗力比较强的。另一方面呢，这个禁军的统帅呢，也都是在多年这种严酷战争里边摸爬滚打打出来的，相对的比较呢有人气。那像这些皇帝也不敢轻易的动他们，所以当时尽管有很多防范这个兵变的这样的一些措施啊，比方说这个严明纪律啦。这个整治一些有反叛心的这样的一些军阀了、将领了，但是没有办法从根本上解决这样的问题。What Li s e y a n had to do was consolidate his power as soon as he took the throne. A fearless general, he did not hesitate to slaughter any potential traitors. Several large-scale massacres averted the threat of further mutinies. Li Suyan also strengthened the central government by reorganizing the imperial guards, as well as defending the court. The imperial guards were sent to control outlying areas. Regional governors were constantly transferred before they had any chance of forming a local power base, and major prefectures were diminished in size. Li Suyan also tried to eliminate the breeding grounds of mutiny. He purged his officials and gave the people of the Central Plains a welcome respite after years of warfare. These measures cut the ground from beneath the feet of potential mutineers. But Li Suyan had one great handicap: his age. Already sixty when he took the throne, and growing old and frail, he was unable to perfect his system of governance. He had no choice but to delegate powers to relatives and close friends, appointing them in place of the powerful military leaders. He probably believed that blood ties could overcome any defects in his system of rule, but would it work? In 933, Li Suyan fell gravely ill. This prompted his second son. Li Zongrong to attack the palace in a bid to usurp the throne. His coup failed, and he was killed. The incident so shocked Li Suyan that he died, miserably disappointed. After a series of battles, Li Suyan's adopted son Li Zongke won the throne in 934. But he remained wary of Li Suyan's son-in-law, Shi Jingtang, who was the military governor east of the Yellow River. Li Zongke decided to force Shi Jingtang out of his district. Li Zongke's decision would bring about his own demise, but it would also create a dire situation for the Central Plains for centuries to come. Faced with the need to resist Li Zongke for his own survival, Shi Jingtang eventually chose to seek support from the Khitans in the northeast. Thanks to various reforms it had introduced, the Khitan Empire had become much stronger. Shi Jingtang now made the Khitans a promise that would drastically alter the political landscape. He would cede to them the 16 prefectures of the Yanyun region. The Yanyun region ran 600 kilometers from east to west and 200 from north to south. Historically, it was not only the natural boundary between the agrarian central plains and the pastoral grasslands of the north; it was also where the central plains kingdoms turned back invasions by the northern nomads. As early as the Warring States period. The states of Yan and Zhao had built defensive walls along the northern mountain ridges. Under the Qin Dynasty, these walls were connected to form the Great Wall. Subsequent dynasties in the Central Plains had kept the walls under heavy guard. They knew that mounted nomads from the north could pour into the Central Plains if the security of the walls were compromised. 
，对任何一个朝代来说，他都必须要就是控制燕云燕云地区，控制燕云地区以后，他基本上就能够能够保证，就是说中原中原这个王朝的这种是这个安全。而如果失去这一道这一道安全安全屏障，就很容易这个就是说，这个就是被少数民族的这种骑兵，呃，这个呃南下。呃，造成对对中原的这种呃王朝造成很大很大的这种影响。那把这个地区呢割给契丹以后呢，契丹它原来是一个游牧民族，那么它基本上呢是以游牧作为它的生产方式和生活方式的。而得到了燕云十六州以后呢，就开始有了一片以农业经济为主的这样的一个地带。那这种情况呢，其实对于契丹民族它本身的发展是有刺激的，而且对于它的这个社会的。结构包括这个辽朝的统治方式，实际上呢，都有一种呃启示或者说一种带动的作用。With the help of the Ketans, Shi Jingtang was able to establish the third Central Plains dynasty, known as the Later Jin, which followed on from the Later Liang and Later Tang. But this left him at the mercy of the Ketans, despite his position as emperor. His heir, Shi Zhongwei, once risked trying to seize the Yanyu region back from the Ketans, but found the task impossible. Between 944 and 947, the Ketan army marched south, wiping out the later Jin dynasty. As the Ketans entered the central plains, they looted and killed. This brutality met with strong resistance, and the Ketans were forced to retreat. Leaving a political vacuum. The vacuum was filled when the deputy governor of Taiyan, Liu Zhiyan, seized power. He founded the later Han Dynasty, but he died within a year. His second son, Liu Changyu, took over, but was soon killed in a mutiny. In the first month of 951, the military governor of Yecheng. Guo Wei led his troops to fight the Khitan invaders. Returning to Kaifeng, he founded the later Zhou Dynasty, the last dynasty of the Five Dynasties period. Guo Wei was succeeded by his nephew and adopted son Chai Rong. They were two of the best emperors in the Five Dynasties. They rooted out abuses and made it a top priority to eliminate the possibility of mutiny. Chai Rong organized a two-tiered imperial corps, with one tier, the palace guards, serving as his bodyguard, and the other as guards of the imperial capital. He wanted to build a military that no regional army could challenge, a fundamental change in the balance of power that had existed since the late Tang Dynasty. 在这个柴荣他整编这个进军的过程中呢，把一些精锐的力量补充到了这个殿前司里边，所以这样的殿前司的这个力量，它的这个作用，在当时的这个进军的结构里边呢，就明显的上升了。那这样呢，几乎成为和侍卫司呢可以并驾齐驱的这样的一支力量。所以呢，这个进军的两司这样的一种。统帅结构或者说一种领导的结构呢，就使那个时候的这个呃禁军的兵变，在一定的程度上呢，受到了这个制约。Chai Rong was also haunted by the problem of Yan Yun. Despite his success in conquering Later Shu and Southern Tang, the sixteen prefectures of Yan Yun were still beyond his reach. He was desperate to seize the region back from the Ketans. In 959, Chai Rong resolved to attack the Ketans. He quickly reclaimed three of the prefectures: Mojo, Yingzhou, and Yizhou. But just as a triumphant Chai Rong was about to invade Yozhou, he suddenly fell ill. He left an unfinished mission and a son and heir, Chai Chongshun, who was just seven years old. As death approached, 
Chai Rung made a last effort to reshuffle personnel in the army for when he was gone. But these last adjustments still could not root out the menace of mutiny. The Five Dynasties era was coming to an end. As if in a long, dark night, one ruler after another had stepped onto the stage of history. Whether it was the shrewd and ruthless Ju Wen, the lover of opera Li Chun Shu, the old and frail Li Su Yan, or the hapless Chai Rung, none of them was able to find a way out of China's political chaos. Much less the seven-year-old Chai Tsung Shu. But history was rolling relentlessly forward. The vast land of the Central Plains was calling out for a great ruler. <laughs>